Okay, welcome so much. So this is the second in a series of the One Seed One community. I am super excited about kind of um, seeing where we can go with this project. It's kind of, we're doing it in community, but we're also learning from each other. And so this is the second time we've had um, a session about this. The first session was with Elizabeth Johnson, who's in um, on the session. So she's available also to answer any questions. Um, this program was first started with uh, by Hilly Salal of the Silicon Valley Grows program. It's based on the idea of the one book, one community where people read the same book in community and then, you know, kind of created a community and a common language and um, view of this. And so now we're going to be doing kind of a similar thing around one, one seed, one community. And so we're going to have Beth um, coming in from Cambridge. Ontario in Canada, sharing her experience. And then I'll talk about doing a little bit of update on my experience. And then we'll go through the worksheet. Um, so people that weren't at the first session have a little bit of a sense of what we did in the first session. And those that recording and uh, resources are also on the seedlibraries.net website. And then th this recording will also be available afterwards. So we have a little worksheet to walk you through. You're going to hear her, her perspective. I'll update on my perspective since the last class, which is kind of humorous. Um, and then we'll have a little time. If anybody has done anything around this in the past or this year, they're welcome to share their perspective. And then we'll have a little bit of work time to see, you know, where do we go next? Beth, take it away. Oh, and in, um, and in the chat, we also have Kay Everett's who is the presenter next week. So next week we are doing a session on Grow Row. So you can sign up for that at seedlibraries.net. Once again, that those recordings will be online as well later on. Um, and she's gonna be helping with chat. Okay, Beth, wanna share your screen? Excellent, I'll start sharing my screen. And I do have, um, I believe I have about 25 minutes and I expect to um, uh, stick with that time. Um, Bear with me if I go a little bit, um, sorry, just setting up my screen here. There we go. Okay. Um, yes, I'll stick to 25 minutes, but also I'm very, very willing to have questions. Um, there's a chance that if you have a question, I might be addressing it later, but um, I do encourage you to put the question as you think about it into the chat, um, and then I can either address it now or, um, or I'll know that I'm going to address that in my presentation so I can save it for after. Um, so just so you don't forget it, I don't want any questions forgotten or missed. So you can put it in the chat, but I may not get to it right away. Um, and just depending, but please, I, there will be time afterwards for questions as well. So to introduce myself, my name is Beth Lanigan. Um, I'm a staff member at a public library in the city of Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. And um, just, uh, just so you know, <laughs> that's about an hour outside of Toronto, just so you can um, know about where that is. And Cambridge has a population of about 140,000, um, 140, just so you know um, about how big that is. The public library calls itself Idea Exchange. It went through a rebrand. I will refer it to it as Idea Exchange, but just remember it is a public library um, and we've just got a fancy name now because we're not just books and movies. We're all kinds of things like seed libraries and initiatives like One Seed Community, which of course is what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I primarily do children's programs and work on the circulation desk, but I've been part of the team to do our seed library program, including One Seed One Community, um, from the very beginning of when we started that. And I'll go through and say a little bit more about when we started that and how and why, um, just to give you context too. And I did think it was important um, to give context about our library and about our seed library program because it really does lead into how and why we did our One Seed One Community. So I will have a few slides not directly talking about One Seed One Community, but giving the context so you really have a sense of how and why we, we do what we do. So our library started off with green things and sustainability because we had a patch of land outside of our branch and one of our wonderful man managers in 2015 um, said, we've got to use this lovely backyard patch. And so we started a children's garden. It began in 2015 through a grant, volunteers and staff maintain it, we grow, we hold events, um, we uh, work with our seed library with it, we have a pollinator garden, and we offer produce to our members for free. Um, after the garden was well established, um, in 2019, 
Um, the, the manager said, well, we already have a garden. So, and they heard about libraries having seed libraries. And they said, why don't we try to start that here? So they thought it would be appropriate to develop it at our branch with the garden. And they approached two part-time staff members, one of whom was myself. And I was part of that initial team of creating a sustainable seed library to be permanently held, housed at the branch. And our mission statement was developed to be in line with library goals. So focusing on free access to materials is a very large one for a public library. Um, access to materials and resources, supporting education, and in this case about seeds, gardening, sustainability, and of course fostering community. That's huge for libraries as well. You can see our mission statement with more fancy wording there. Um, so from the very beginning, um, which was in 2017, um, which was National Seed Swap Day, uh, we had support from local organizations. We've got this beautiful old postal cabinet. Um, and of course, most people here know what the most basic of a seed library can be is a storage system for seeds where there's a system of people taking to grow, save and give back. Um, in our case, our seed library is open all year. We accept all types of seeds um, from donations, communities, and organizations. We newly have a small budget where we can be more selective with our seeds, and we are, um, but we do get a large number from these other places as well. No membership is required. Um, seed return is encouraged, um, but not required either. Seeds are kept in an open area, and education is supported from a very uh, various ways. Um, and I know this is different from some seed libraries too, but part of the public library mandate was that it was free and open access to everybody. So because we're in a public library, um, that was what our library decided to do. Um, from the very beginning, the seed, our seed library was conceptualized as a resource that would also come with related programming though. We didn't just want to provide uh, seeds to the community for food access, food sustainability, supporting gardeners, of course, those are valuable, but we also wanted to support knowledge, um, knowledge of planting and growing, knowledge of seeds and seed saving and all kinds of related topics. So we did have not just our events and eco fairs, but we have workshops that we um, run regularly, including beginner, intermediate and advanced seed saving. And we will do multiple seed saving workshops per year. Um, but we've also had other types of workshops, things like growing medicinal and culinary herbs, um, safer soils, how to preserve your harvest, native pollinator plants, and many more. Uh, and just to say, uh, I'm not an expert in necessarily in all of these things. Uh, as a public library um, uh, worker, I am a connector, a facilitator, and a host. And what we would do is we'd host these workshops, we'd facilitate them, we would um, but we would find uh, local experts in each one of these uh, areas to run the workshops in our public library. Okay. Um, and there's a question about, uh, does the library itself provide the resources for the seed library? Um, or is it a function of the library's friends group? So it's not the library's friends group, but we did have community partners, which I'll talk a little bit more about afterwards. Um, so it's a combination. We do have a small budget for the library to purchase seeds now, but we didn't at the beginning. At the beginning, we relied on donations and uh, support from local organizations. So not necessarily organizations like Friends of the Library, but um, uh, the local community garden would save seeds for us and a local conservation uh, uh, area would save seeds for us and so on. And I'll talk more about that afterwards. Um, promoting courses, we would definitely promote um, through our library website and, um, and magazine. And also if we had the expert coming in from an organization, that organization would promote it as well. And I would say we did have big appetite for these courses. Um, we're a very small branch. So when we first started, it was hard to get the word out. We would maybe have 15 people at a workshop, but we've had as much as for with our eco fairs, when we had larger uh, amount of organizations come in, we would have 150 people in the library um, over a two hour event. So it varied, but um, we would consistently, the seed saving ones especially was, there was definitely an appetite for and continues to be an appetite for. We're always kind of surprised because we're like, oh, we run this a lot. Are we gonna get it next time? But we figured out every single time people want to learn uh, and we're getting different people as well. 
sometimes we'll get um, the same people who are doing the intermediate or advanced ones, but we're always surprised to see um, new people as well. Um, we don't pay our, the public library in Ontario, at least. Uh, the question is, how can you afford workshop speaker when you're starting out without a budget? That's a very good question. And as a public library, um, there's not a lot of funds for speakers. Um, and as two part timers who are doing a side project in the library, it was very difficult. We mainly would approach people and say, our mandate is to get information out for free. We understand if you don't want to do a presentation for us, but we're just asking, will you do it for free? We will provide promotion, we'll provide, you know, we try to offer as much as we can, but we're very upfront that in most cases we can't pay speakers. And we do have um, great relationships with organizations that also have a mandate of doing um, presentations for free because of their mandate of promoting education or awareness around their issues. So we've been very lucky and yes, Master Gardeners um, uh, have been wonderful to us as well. Local horticultural, horticultural clubs have been wonderful for us. Um, and, uh, and we are happy to work with them with whatever criteria they have. Great questions so far. I'm going to keep going now. Um, so for us, oh, here we go we did see big growth. So in the first four years, we gave out between 1,000 to 2,000 packages of seeds per year. Um, there was a huge jump in 2021. And I, I imagine some of you in your own organizations may have seen that jump and in that interest in gardening and gardening related um, topics as well. 2022, even more 2023 even more. Now there's a combination of things here. It was interest after the pandemic. Um, it was more, we got more donations. So we were able to give out more and changes in how we gave it out and the support we had internally to actually make all those packages happen. So you can see those last two years, it's jumped significantly. 2023 so far, we we're only a few months in and we've already um, uh, given out more than we ever have before. So we're hopping. This feels like quite an achievement for us. First four years, it was just two part-time staff members at the library doing it as a side project along with our other duties. Um, 2021, we said we need more help. So we had four part-time staff members. Finally, just this past year, we have the whole branch um, with uh, assisting in running the seed library and related programming, including One Seed One Community, as well as managerial support, leadership and engagement and a small budget two years ago. So um, we have a few other things I can talk more about if you're interested in encouraging your local libraries to have these kinds of things. Tool lending, we're part of B City, which is part of a larger initiative of B City Canada. I'm not sure if there's something similar in the US, but B City Canada supports regions and cities to have uh, pollinator friendly um, awareness, prom events, uh, promotion, seeds, uh, etc. about the importance of um, native pollinators in our world. So um, that's something that we were a founding organization to get Cambridge as part of a bee city. Um, I'm going to go into community partners because they were key for our one seed one community. Um, community partner could be an individual, an organization or a business. And we've had lots of support with mutual seed donations, resources, that lovely old post office cabinet is an example, this lovely cafe that did uh, sustainable and local food um, sources with their food has supported us with some of our events. Um, mutual promotion is a big thing too, to get the word out with things we're doing and contribution, contribution to events, different locations, things like that. And through the years with our various com uh, community partners, we had a particular um, good working relationship with three in particular that became our um, the base for our One Seed One community programming as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about them so that you have some context about what they do as well. And you can think about uh, if community partners is uh, an area you'll go through. Um, to support your one seed community, you can think about related organizations that may have some of these benefits as well. Seeds of Diversity Canada, if you don't already know about them, they're a great resource. Um, it's a national organization that protects Canada's seed biodiversity in um, so many ways. So they're really dedicated to uh, conservation and documentation of um, 
plants of significance, uh, thousands of members across Canada. You know, I, I keep updating this number because every time I go to their website, it's more and more. And they propagate and distribute um, almost 4,000 varieties and important significant heirloom varieties of uh, plants of all kinds. Um, and they're based very close to us in the region of Waterloo, which is where Cambridge is in, um, in Ontario here. And so we actually, the, the CEO and founding member, Bob Wildfong, who's probably done workshops you may have gone to um, on Zoom or otherwise, he's, he's local to us, and which is just a treasure for us. Um, Rare Charitable Research Reserve is an urban land trust and environment mental institute. So they have um, over a thousand acres of land and they do everything with it. They have trail maintenance, in, uh, community gardens, research initiatives, ecological monitoring, camps, pollinator preserves, workshops. It's They do everything and, and they're very committed to um, seed saving, to supporting other organizations, and they've been invaluable to us as well. And of course, the Cambridge Food Bank. Now, a food bank you may have um, a, a conception of. Our local food bank is dedicated to building food security, like others, but it's also really concerned with prioritizing environmental sustainability and food security. So they have a big mandate, for example, a big mandate to limit food waste and to give out fresh food as much as possible. So they do give out um, uh, ca uh, canned food as well, but uh, they're very concerned with fresh food. And they do have a seed library as well. So we had a good relationship with these um, with these organizations, and in 2019, early 2019, um, my colleague saw a reference to One Seed One community, community programs, and I believe it was in the Richmond Grows newsletter, and so saw that this is something that somebody did, and it, it had huge resonance to her because as library workers, we do one book, one community every year. And so she could see the parallels of the work we were already doing with our seed library, with our community partners, with trying to get um, education and awareness out. Of, of, and and we, she saw the parallel that could happen in our region too. So at the time, it was still just two part-time workers, myself and her. And so we reached out to our community partners because we saw potential for each group and organization to share strengths and workloads to make this initiative more feasible for us to start. So we did, um, we did, <laughs> and we chose the provider bean for the first year and we launched in late February, 2020. Um, and I'm sorry, I, here we go. So our concept of One Seed, One Community um, is uh, some of what, and just remember what some of what I'm going to say will be different than your experience if you've seen different ones. And that's kind of the beauty of it too, that everybody takes it and runs it with it in a different way. Um, so what we're really emphasizing is that to, for participants to participate and learn about the full circle growing process through spring to fall. Plant a seed, care for a plant as it grows, harvest and enjoy. Donate the excess to a food bank, share your excess, and save seeds to share, donate, or use in the future. And so it really is this receiving and giving back and continuing the cycle that we really wanted to emphasize. Um, with our community partners, it's a beautiful thing to have community partners because you can really um, uh, share the load. It's also tricky, and I'll talk to speak to that as well because you're you have competing priorities. So I know I think I think that in your last one you were talking about what are your goals, what are your priorities, what what is your why, and we definitely had to sit down and talk a lot about what our why is uh, because seeds of diversity has uh, slightly different priorities as the library and so on. Um, so it was been a very interesting but wonderful journey for us. So for us, we kind of divvied up main roles. Even though we work together, we are busy people who all have different capacities in these organizations, but we thought we could each bring something to this One Seed, One Community initiative. So Idea Exchange, the public library, our strengths are that we can distribute seeds to the community very easily. We have six different branches in Cambridge. Um, we have a seed library that was well used even at that point. 
Um, and we do workshops and events and we can get seeds out. We can host events in our physical location and we have access to volunteers um, to help us with the seed prep workload um, because that's a large part of it too. How are you giving out, you know, it's more affordable to buy in bulk as far as practicalities, um, but it's it, how do you give them out with information? Um, and that was something that we could do. Seeds of Diversity is the ex had so much expertise for um, choosing seeds. They have the expertise for workshops and programming that we could offer alongside One Seed One Community. And they had access to land to distribute, plant out, and save seeds through their own programming. Similar to Rare Charitable Research Preserve, which was the environmental preserve, they could plant out and save seeds through their lands and their community gardens, and they could lead planting workshops on site. Um, the food bank had different priorities too. They could distribute seeds through their seed library. They could lead cooking workshops on whatever seed it was. Um, but they're also looking for to be the recipient of the, the giving back por portion of fresh food and seeds. But also they have <laughs> wonderful grants uh, that they could um, support us by um, purchasing the seeds um, so that we could all benefit uh, from that to run the program. Um, so that's quite valuable as well. So for us, for our model, in November or December, typically, we meet with each other, either virtually or in person. And mainly what we do is we decide the seed type um, programming, and we make purchasing decisions. So you may have gone through this, or you will, that there's lots to decide when you're deciding a seed type. Are you considering ease of growing? Are you ease of seed saving? Is it the, the size, look, and texture of the seed may be something you take into consideration? We certainly did. We wanted, to, wanted it to be accessible, um, interesting. Uh, we've even talked about, is there an engaging name that we can, that we can appeal to people with? Um, is it going to be an heirloom or native or other significant variety to our region or to the world? And um, it, those are very interesting decisions as well when you're taking into priorities. Uh, so the food bank may have a priority that something is easy to cook and work with and nutritional value, um, seeds of diversity, and all of us were concerned with making sure it was a seed that was significant. Um, heirloom preferably. Um, and we were all wanted something to be accessible for people of all ages. So um, teeny tiny seeds are wonderful. We need them. Seeds are all different. But for this type of program, we wanted a bigger seed. Um, at that time, we decide rough outline of programming. Are we going to have a launch event? Are we going to offer workshops? Are we going to have a closing event? What are we going to do throughout the season to engage people, to um, have accountability for each step of that full circle growing process? And of course, at that time, the food bank, uh, through the grant, procures labels, envelopes, and um, seeds through the grant. So then in December and January, Primarily library staff and volunteers prepare packages. And my apologies if I'm missing chat. I'm just, it didn't go, I'm not seeing it. So I hope, I hope I'm not missing too much. Um, I, I will see it after, it might just be the way I'm sharing. Um, so I will, whatever questions you do have there, I will address. Um, so in December and January, library staff and volunteers prepare packages. So we design a, a package label and we do share that between different places as well, I see. Um, we have eight to 12 seeds per package generally, depending on the seed. And we give sets of seeds packaged up, as you see in the picture, back to each organization to distribute, or we set some aside for bulk growing that will be seed saved back. February or March, generally we have our launch event, and that's when we start distributing seeds to the community from the library and from each organization. Um, I'll just check the question here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, and then, apologies. So then in April, May, or June, we, gen we want to have a planting workshop. We do continue engagement throughout as well. We do have promotion, uh, which I will speak to later, I guess, um, about um, engaging people online. And I'll speak to, <laughs> we, we did start in February, 2020. So um, just one month later, online became very important uh, as you remember. Um, 
But generally in April, May, June, our goal is to have some sort of planting workshop. How do you support and grow this plant? Um, depending on the seed, of course, that timing is. Uh, July and August, we would have growing check-ins. We encourage sharing, recipe sharing, growing tip sharing, and ideally we would have a cooking workshop. How do you cook and prepare your harvest? September, October is when we have our seed saving workshop. On various years, we've also had one in the spring um, just to kind of prepare people for the idea as well. Um, and then we would have a fresh food drive as a wrap up event to, to really encourage people of that giving back piece, uh, especially for the food bank, but also to encourage people to bring back their seeds to the seed library, to the food bank or to the library as well. And throughout the season, February to October, we have education and promotion throughout signage in the library and on the seed package. We have a Facebook page with information and education. And of course, Facebook has sharing opportunities um, and each community partner website would each have information about One Seed, One Community and related workshops. So some numbers and successes in 2020, we chose the provider bean. We gave out over 3000 packages, a couple hundred attended workshops, and we had 150 pounds of specifically provider beans donated back to the food bank. 2021 was the Cascadia P. Um, seed, uh, you can see almost 3000 seed packages given out, fewer number attended workshops. You know why about that. Um, more donations, which was great. Uh, 2022 was the Golden Queen Tomato. You can see the numbers there. And this year we have an edamame bean. I will say with the numbers, look at them with a bit of a grain of salt because, um, for example, the fact that we had 4,000 packages given out in 2022 doesn't mean that more people were interested. It's actually that we had a different budget each year, a different grant each year. And so each year we gave out as much as we purchased. So we there was no, as much as we had, we gave out. And the number varies because we could, uh, the price of, of seeds is different. The grant that we got was different. So that doesn't reflect interest, that reflects um, uh, funding basically. Also, the number of people coming varied greatly. There was in-person, there was virtual, there was, um, uh, we, there were times where we weren't even allowed to have workshops. We decided not to do like a cooking workshop online. There was capacity changes as far as different organizations. So, and there was changes in how stats were, um, were, were. So, so you can ask specific questions about our stats, but I'll just say it doesn't necessarily mean that less people, fewer people were interested year to year. It was more about, um, uh, there was lots of uh, variety of factors, which also tells us, hey, what do we, what kind of statistics do we want to collect as far as engagement? How do we want to um, show accountability and interest in this program? So that's something us as an organization and the other organizations are reevaluating constantly. <laughs> um, and I'll check this question here. Um, will I cover this, but did I have a seed processing uh, workshop or volunteer day? As far as saving seeds back, um, is that the, so I will say, so as far as saving seeds back, um, we, we did not. We actually, but that was a goal to have at the, at the uh, participating organizations. Um, there's lots of reasons we haven't done it, but it was a goal and is a goal. Um, but we didn't specifically have that. We supported that in a seed saving workshop, but not actually with our with our um, with our seeds. In in the library's case, we just we um, had some problems with our garden various times, so we didn't have enough to seed save. Uh, we had we had critters problems. Everybody knows this. <laughs> Sometimes you have critter problems. Our small library did. Um, at rare and at seeds of diversity, they had their own uh, seed processing uh, times and we weren't able to communicate and collaborate fast enough to make it associated with one seed community, one community, which we realized we should have after. So great question, great impulse, great goal, and it's something we're still working on. But I would definitely encourage people to do that. Um, okay, plans versus reality. That's a great, um, <laughs> a great segue into plans versus reality. Sometimes 
things throw you or you you have goals that you for whatever reason you can't meet so COVID-19 I don't know that I need to say much more about that except COVID-19 happened um we launched in February 2020 with over 100 people in the library uh, and huge excitement and huge plans and we immediately had to change everything and I will say as you know, as everybody knows, that that was an issue well into 2021. And into 2022, along with COVID came a lot of reevaluation of how um, organizations run, a lot of uh, reprioritization, a lot of individuals reprioritizing their lives, which meant a lot of staffing changes. Um, so I would say each of our organizations, the public library and our partner organizations, went through drastic change. Um, in the past three years. So it's been a bit of a labor of love to keep One Seed One Community going. So not all our goals were able to be um, uh, achieved each year. We placated ourselves by uh, telling ourselves that perfect is the enemy of good. We thought there were many times that we had to say, are we going to continue this? Um, even if it's not as good as we hoped or it was in the past. And in the end, what we decided is that, yes, it is still valuable to do for, for uh, hopeful reasons. And we hope in future years we'll be able to get it together more and um, bring more of our goals to fruition. Um, but also for the reasons that um, it, even at its most basic of uh, giving seeds out, promoting the full circle process, we thought it was valuable. Um, so even if we couldn't do every single workshop that we wanted, um, or uh, we, we decided it was still valuable even in a simpler form. So, and that's with the hopeful goal that we may return to full goals and new ideas in future years. So, which, uh, for example, we want to continue getting seeds out to the community each year. We want to, there's possibilities for additional meaningful partnerships. Uh, there was an exciting possibility about an indig Indigenous seed in our area and partnering with an Indigenous um, group so that we would promote um, the, uh, th those practices for growing as well. Um, I would say one of our weak points is tracking of participants. And, and that's the thing that you have to, that as a library, we decided um, not to uh, focus on at the beginning, but it may be valuable for your organization to track how many people are actually doing every step of the process. We so far have been tracking how many we give out, how many people come to workshops, but we don't necessarily know if they're the same people. So we're, we hope to have the capacity to reevaluate that and maybe improve that engagement and tracking to make sure that we're encouraging that follow through on those um, secondary steps. Um, other goals, we have more workshops on growing and seed saving. Some of those fell off, fell off during um, 2020 and 2021. So we wanna return to those in person um, after we get it together organizationally. More formalized signups, maybe bigger promotion and draws to increase buy-in for the food drive. These are things that we're considering constantly. And I hope that, um, I hope that part of our my uh, candor with um, with how things are going, uh, even in a simplified way and its imperfect way, can help encourage you to know that whatever you decide to do, it doesn't have to be perfect either. You know, you'll start it, you'll have grand plans, you may do all your grand plans, and still might learn that you might want to do something differently the next year. And I think that's okay. <laughs> um, we've certainly found uh, really good. Um, we've had great feedback about our program. People are interested, people are learning. Um, and yet, after doing it for a few years too, I can I can say that there's things that I would do differently if I had all the resources in the world too. Um, so it's it's definitely uh, learning and changing every moment. And that's my presentation. So I hope you do have more questions about about um, any, any portions of this at all? I can stop sharing now. There we go. Wow! Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe let's um, let's take like five minutes to do that, and then I'll do a little bit of recap on mine in the process, and then we'll take more questions. So, 
Um, so I just see at the beginning it says, um, so the part one, so what I'll do is when you get the, um, the recording for this one, I'll send the link to part one, but it's also up on seedlibraries.net. So we have a particular page called One Seed One Community on seedlibraries.net where the original um, talk that Elizabeth Johnson and uh, Hilly Salal, who created this program, did at one of our summits is on there, as well as the one that Elizabeth and I did, as well as this one. So those will all be, they're already on that, and this one will be put up there as well. Any other questions? Well, I'm, I'm glad it's helpful at all. I um, I know that everybody does things differently, so I hope that our experience will um, oh, yes, the resources page, um, primarily, um, it just has our website, which is uh, very basic at this time, I'll put it back up, I'll put it back up. And it does have um, my email and my manager's email, if you have further questions, if you think of something, I'm happy to. Um, and you can also email that to me. So when they, when I send out the email to the participants, it can all be in there, too. So it's all in. Yeah, place. okay, I'll put it back up for a second, but I will. Um, Oh, I definitely can talk more about the the packing and labeling process for sure. Um, can you can you see the oh, hold on. Yeah, you can also copy if you want to, you can also copy and paste um, that information and stick it in the chat. So I can do that too. Okay, so yes, and it's it's just our brief. Um, um, I think I've probably given you more information than you'll see on the website there. So uh, if you want this PowerPoint too, it's, um, I think I did put it in the Skillshare. Uh, I'm not sure if they have access to. Yeah, so uh, there's a there's a public folder that people also yes. get access to. So yeah, I can put it in the public folder so people can see it there. Great, and the question was about the packaging and labeling process. So what we do is part of the grant gets these small coin envelopes. So I think I had some pictures um, earlier in the presentation. They're, um, yeah, just about that big. You can get smaller sizes too. Um, and if you buy them in bulk, they can be fairly and more affordable. Um, we get them from, um, I believe it's Staples, like the, 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 um, there's a there's a part of Staples that gives to that is for larger organizations. So not in the store, but through the back end. Like if you go on the website for larger organizations, you can buy them in bulk. Um, and so these coin envelopes are what we put the seeds in. And then we have we also get labels from I believe the same place. And you can design it on Microsoft Word or another program. Uh, it, the When the labels come, there's information about how to uh, make sure that your design on your computer will match when you put it in. And most laser jet ink printers will, will print the labels. So we design it and then literally just print hundreds of these labels and we have volunteers. Um, we have a, a, a lovely volunteer, a 87 year old woman who does most of our most of our seed packaging, um, but we also have a few others too. We have one volunteer that will take them home and uh, and scoop them in front of as she watches a show. We've got our um, in house volunteers who sit around a table uh, on certain days, and it's it's nice because it's social too. They're scooping um, uh, you know ten seeds into these little coin envelopes and then putting the pre printed labels onto the coin envelopes. The pre-printed labels, depending on your your um, uh, depending on the size of the envelopes you get, uh, and if you're going to put the label on both sides or not, you can put a lot of information there. Or something we're thinking about for next year is a QR code that could go to something else, telling more about growing process because it's hard to put all the information in a very small spot. But so that's something we're thinking about is putting that little. QR code so that people can then get more information. But at the very least, we we have um, we we have basic growing instructions and the names of each organization so they can find out more. We also have signage with um, like where they pick it up. We have signage about how to grow, and so people know that they can come back to the library with any questions as well. Does that answer your question? I'm happy to. Um, do we count weight or both? Um, so we um, count, we count. Um, so, and we've so far done seeds that are easily countable. So we, the provider bean is a good size, easily countable. Cascadia pea was easily countable. Tomatoes were more difficult. Uh, another year, we probably wouldn't count. We would 
you know, do an estimate of these tiny, the tiny scoops that you can purchase, um, and we would probably do a scoop instead. Um, we haven't done weighing. Um, that's a good, a good possibility, but we have to make it really easy for volunteers too. So we've done counting or scooping. We do for a lot of our other tiny seeds, the, 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 the tiny scoops. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear about the, the benefits of weighing. That's not something we've done. We've counted. They, they do it professionally a lot. Yeah, weighing. Yeah. Professionally, but yeah. that's like larger volumes. And actually those questions, I am going to address those questions in today's talk. So we'll come back to those as well. Awesome. I think I'm going to move on at this point, but keep your questions because we'll come back and have an opportunity to ask more questions of Beth for sure after um, kind of, uh, kind of hear some other things about where we're going today. So let me kind of share my screen, assuming I can manage this. Um, to do share screen. Oh my goodness. Oh, I'll stop. That's probably what's stopping you. Here we go. Oh no, you weren't, you weren't shopped. I was just, I was just forgetting how to do it again. Er, stop video now. Um, so funny share screen. I don't see my share screen button. I gotta like move my, come on. There we go. Now we see the button. Um, so I am Rebecca Newbern. I am with the um, Richmond Grows Seed Lending Library, and I also um, write the uh, Cool Beans newsletter. So let's see. Um, so this is the second second pass on One Seed Community. As I mentioned, if you came in a little bit late, uh, we do have the first uh, class where I did more of a longer presentation of our One Seed One Community. I'm doing two at the moment, so I'll kind of, I'm going to give you a little update on in the last month, things that I've learned and things that I've decided, as Beth said, it's kind of like you're, you know, you're doing it, you got a direction, and then you reassess and decide, is that how we want to do it, or is that still working for us? So I am coming from um, the beautiful Ohlone lands, which is the East Bay of San Francisco. Um, if you happen to be in the San Francisco Bay area, I encourage you to, um, uh, check out the Shumi land tax, which is a way to um, rematriate the land here and give it back to the uh, indigenous people who still live and reside here. Um, this is our little graphic that we've been using designed by a local artist, which we just love, which is it's actually a paper cutout. So as I said, I'm doing two projects simultaneously. One is in the East Bay. So we have 25 different seed libraries at this point. Most of them are in public libraries. One, the Berkeley Ecology Center, Basil was the oldest one, and that's actually in the uh, Berkeley Ecology Center. And now there's actually 30 seed libraries, but five of them are native um, only. So they're not actually doing the one seed one community. So I put the 25 are participating in this one seed one community. I bought at the beginning of the pandemic, a huge bunch of seeds. So we were 100% local before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, all of our seeds were locked up in the seed library and people we knew were gonna be very interested in growing. So we just bought a whole bunch of seeds also to make it easy for people to pack up. And um, I have a stole a lot of the provider bush beans. So we're also doing provider bush bean. Uh, we, whatever, are kind of a 100% volunteer-based, um, you know, community-supported process. So we try to do things as inexpensively as possibly. When we were thinking about doing the one seed one community, it was really to, I mean, obviously building communities always really kind of at the, the foundation, but we also wanted to, we had the vision of if we get people to save this initial seed, then they'll maybe be interested in continuing to save, you know, that seed or a different seed that they're in love with. And some of those, maybe out of 25 of those people, some of those might level up and decide to go and try like, well, let me try to see if I can hand pollinate or, or learn something, some new skills in terms of seed saving. So our hope was that we can kind of also usher in kind of a new um, group of seed savers in the process. And just making people aware of the fact, the fact that the seed library exists is obviously always something that we're doing, although that now with so many of them, people are more and more aware of the fact that there are seed libraries, maybe not that there's 25 in the area, but that they do exist. So we'll talk a little bit more about the, the worksheet that we used last time, but one of the first steps is knowing, you know, having your, knowing your why, like, why are you doing this? Are you just trying to get people gardening? And then you might be focusing more your classes on gardening or you interested more in building seed savers. So as I said, we were really, we have a, a very strong gardening community here. So trying to get more people to save seeds was one of our kind of main 
main goals and having a plan to educate people. So on our packets, and I know you can't really necessarily see this, but we have on the packet itself, we have the um, information about planting. We have the information about harvest, um, you know, the notes about the actual variety, um, planting instructions, and then seed saving instructions. We were trying to get people to sign up for our, our plan saying like, you're going to sign up. And so at our different tables, we have a QR code. We have a tiny URL if people don't have a scanner saying, you know, join us, you know, we're saving provider Bushbean. Everything's in Spanish and English. We have our Spanish packets in a different color. So it's easy for us at events to give them out. So I distributed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of packets with this, with the instructions to the seed libraries. And so far only six people have filled in the QR code. And those were at the event that I was tabling at and got people to do it. So, um, so this is kind of one of the things that I have noticed, which is like, if you were trying to get people's and not most public libraries can't necessarily get people's, you know, private information. So that might be part of the reason why it's not happening, but I'm saying at the other events, people aren't signing up, you know, they'll, they'll start and then they just don't finish. So we had this aha moment the other day, which was two weeks ago, we invited uh, Julia Dakin from going to seed.org, which is an organization that's working with land raised very genetically diverse seeds. And we did this collaborative community seed project. So people showed up to this class. It was, you know, about a presentation about we're going to all pick three species in our community and we're going to give you the seeds and we're going to grow them and we're going to walk you through the seed saving process. We had 45 people sign up to attend this, you know, seed saving class where they were specifically going to be growing something in community and returning some of the seeds back to the community. And we've been trying to get people to like join our grow row program, grow row program. And all of a sudden all the people just showed up. And so we decided at that event that maybe that is what we need to do with our one seed one community. I mean, we're obviously going to still give out, you know, hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of packets, seed packets, you know, with this and probably, you know, with all these seed saving instructions and chances are, you know, for the five emails we have pre-written out that we're going to give you and all this stuff, you know, very few people are going to actually sign up for this, but we have decided to have a community seed saving class that we're doing in collaboration. So Richmond Grows is going to do a collaboration with um, Urban Health, which is a um, uh, you know um, an urban ag group that's you know run by people of color. It's our fiscally sponsored uh, group for Richmond Grows, and then also the other seed libraries are kind of tacking you know involved in it as well. And then everybody who attends that our seed saving class is going to be given you know, one of these packets, and then we'll continue to send emails through the season being like, how's it going? How's it going? So we're hoping that that might be moving forward if we're really trying to get more seed savers, you know, that then hopefully we'll contribute seeds to the seed library that this might be the way we're going to go. So this is, this is the new, the new vision because <laughs> we can pass out hundreds, thousands of seed packets and people hopefully read, but we, you know, we don't know. Um, and then the other thing that happened was since our last, um, the first meeting was I, I've been trying to reach our master gardener coordinator and we're also a project of the master gardeners because a number of our volunteers are master gardeners. So it was nice for them to get volunteer hours with us. And I was trying to have, um, to see if they would give us a table at an event that they were doing. So we could just give, you know, these at their great tomato giveaway, giveaway sale. And, you know, she was the head of the master gardener was like, no, we can't do that. But you can, you know, you can have your table outside of our event because of all the branding stuff. And I was like, we're not available to be there. We were just hoping to give you a bag of seeds. And she's like, no, we can't do that unless we had an MOU. And so what what eventually happened with that conversation with us um, um, head of the master garden is, is like, well, why don't you guys just do your own one seed one community? And she was just delighted with the idea. So if you happen to be a master gardener involved in master gardeners, you know, they have all these touch points in the community, um, you know, and their mission is around education. They love to give out free seeds, but usually they're just donated seeds from some, you know, the random seeds. So this would be a great opportunity for master gardeners to give out a particular seed 
collect information and then be able to then invite people to different classes. And then they could also get people the information throughout the growing season. So this is just, I think, a really wonderful way for master gardeners to meet a lot of their, their goals is by hosting their own one seed one community. So that's kind of my, my little new takeaway from that one. Um, let's see. So our other thing was, so I'm doing the one in the, the East Bay where I live. And then I'm also doing one, I'm a middle school science teacher, and we're also doing a one seed one community. And this, we did it before, but it was just at the middle school where I teach science just through the science classes. And this year I asked if we could do it district wide. We're only three schools, so it's kind of small. And so we have this evening, if you happen to have children, there's in the, uh, at least in the United States, we have this thing called an open house where it's at the end of the school years and parents come and kind of just walk around and get to meet the teachers and see school work. So we provided seeds at open house. And once again, people could sign up with a QR code. Um, and also we had it put out in the parent bulletin. So we had more people sign up through the parent bulletin um, and less take it. At, I mean, people took it in the evening, but they didn't sign up. So we had a lot of people sign up and then pick stuff up, but signing up ahead of time was super helpful. My, I have a little seed library group at the middle school and they volunteered to have at open house, a table out in front of our seed library in our, in our um, middle school public library. And they were just like passing out seeds left and right. And I was just like, they gave away, I don't know how many, I mean, like probably, probably 60 packets. However, you know, same thing. They had the little QR code and they're just like, well, yeah, people filled in the, you know, scan the QR code. But I said only three people out of those 60 people actually filled in the QR code. And those were two of them were parents of the kids that were volunteering. So I was just kind of a little frustrated by that. So I kind of, I think there's a thing that if you're trying to get the, and especially these are kids that don't necessarily how we're having all this information that's going to be created by, by students in kid-friendly language, they're going to be making these little cartoons to kind of walk them through the planting stages. And so now I'm having to go back and see if I can kind of collect some of that information about who the parents are that actually signed up. Um, I did get a couple more after I sent an email to my kids' parents, but still, it was it was a I felt like it was a lost opportunity. So if you are wanting to do it where you're getting the the information from people, so you can send out a series of like. And now what we're doing or come to our seed saving class, then I would really make sure people fill in the QR code and you can see that it's done before you give them the seeds. That's my little takeaway. Um, and yeah, so we were also thinking about maybe trying to gamify it a little bit, which is like, okay, now you've picked up the seeds and now you've planted them. And so as we're getting information from these kids, you know, giving them little badges in their email saying, you know, you know, where they are in the process. So we can kind of track that. And then they feel like they're, they're a little bit more motivated to kind of get through the, the end process. Um, so uh, let's see, over what period of time was that you got? Oh, so the, so in terms of the giving out seed packet, so I went to one event one evening, it was a seed swap. And in the, the seed swap, I mean, obviously people could just go grab whatever they wanted to, but I was sitting outside at a table talking about the Grow Row program and this um, class we were offering with Julia Dakin and we have the One Seed One community as well. So the six seed packets I gave were that night. So it was just like, I'm sitting outside, people signed up, it was awesome. Um, but people also were just grabbing just whatever seeds they wanted to. Um, have you tried anything to incentivize returning seeds, maybe a price? So we have we have been talking about that. We're also trying to think about like, how do we do this in a, you know, cause seeds for many people are very sacred. And so we wanna kind of think about how can we, vision in a way that kind of honors that um, heritage, but also still like appreciates people that actually go through that whole process. So we are looking at, we have been looking at for at least for our grow a row program, which is where we're asking people to grow a specific variety, specifically for seed, for the seed library, to have some things such as, you know, two free passes to the botanical garden, and so getting things like that donated. So it's more of like an experience that kind of inspires them to maybe continue to go more, you know, so we have been thinking about ways to kind of, you know, support people. Cause I think one of the things that has happened with us is we haven't, we when, even when we've gotten the names, we haven't been super good about following through. So one of the things I mentioned last time is putting a calendar invite. I'll get into that part in a moment. Um, I see for folks who do, who, do use QR codes, you have a text message rather than an email. 
Um, yeah, people can do either text or or emails and in Spanish and English. So we kind of are making it whatever way works for you. We're trying to make it work for them. So I'm going to kind of get into just a quick recap of the last class, just sort of for people. I mean, some of it, Beth touched on a lot about it. Um, I've already mentioned about the um, the why. Know your why, and um, and I think um, yeah. So Kay put in the worksheet. So if you have the worksheet because you participated last time, you could open that up. If you did not participate last time, you could just make a copy of that worksheet, just so you can kind of see kind of the thinking. And I loved how how um, Beth and their group also had kind of a timeline. So you might want to put your own timeline um, that works for you and your own area. Thinking about like who, you know, who are you going to partner with? Um, Beth did a really nice job of like talking about that. You know, we, you know, we're doing a lot more this year with, um, we couldn't do the Master Gardener. So I realized that that's not going to happen because we can do it. We could do it with them only, but because ours is an whole East Bay regional thing. We couldn't do it because they don't have a relationship with that whole organization. They just have the relationship with us. And so, um, and it would be a whole branding thing and MOUs and all that stuff. So we're kind of just doing it more with um, urban ag groups. And um, the Slow Food Group also has volunteered to kind of do more promotional stuff. So we've been, and the horticulture departments have been great about sharing that information as well. Um, and then kind of, um, as Beth mentioned, like, you know, picking something that's going to have some connection in some ways. And we've, we often suggest as a first pass to do a bean, just because when people touch beans and coming out of a pot, it's really just, there's something really visceral that wakes up in us that just is like, like, yay, seeds. Um, whereas we, although we need the lettuce seeds, it's a little bit hard to get enthusiastic about little lettuce seeds. Although I think they're super cool, but like, I can just know my kids and when my students are processing bean seeds, they're just delighted. Um, I mean, they actually love all, planting all of them, but they, they can't get their fingers out of the bean seeds. Um, also when you're deciding to pick a variety, uh, make sure it's not a hybrid. Um, you know, make sure it um, does not have, is not a plant protected variety. Once again, if you're picking in a, something that's an heirloom variety or is called open pollinated, you will be okay in that regard. Um, oh, actually, yeah. And then, um, and you can see this is just a quick snapshot from Johnny's select. So you can see that Johnny's, if you click on the quick facts, it'll tell you if it's a PVP. Uh, that's plant variety protection. And all, while you can save them for yourself, you can't share them. So don't buy PVPs, don't buy hybrids. And once again, you can watch the other video about why, you know, why you would select a particular thing. But we we were looking at something that was um, you know, interesting, it had a story behind it. You know, we like the bean seeds because they're very tactile. We also picked a dual purpose so that people could, you know, as a minimum, dual, as a minimum, like a green bean. Dual purpose is fine, but it's a little bit harder to get people to grow a soup bean or something like that because just, you know, if they're only going to get like this much beans for the whole harvest, they might be a little discouraged to then want to share out, you know, a portion of that because there's so little that they actually harvest, at least in our area, because we're kind of a suburban area. Um, okay, so I wanted to just give a little bit of time to see if anyone... Um, before we do this, I'm going to just kind of go over the kind of guidelines here. So we're going to do just about 10 to 15 minutes of kind of check-in. So with this, this kind of, we all have a role in tending the space. Um, during the Skillshare, we agree to speak for ourselves and make space for others, be as present as possible, be aware of who is missing in each conversation. Remember that no one has a monopoly on truth and everyone's experience is valid. Critique ideas, not people. Listen to our bodies and tend to their needs. Give some grace for technical and logistical difficulties. Aim for connection, not perfection. Avoid slang as some participants may be uh, multilingual and English is not their home language. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and just kind of see if there are, yeah, beans are magical, yeah. Um, if any people, um, I'm gonna go to, if you, I'm going to go to 
Um, instead of speaker view, I'm going to go to gallery view. So if you do not, and this is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded and your, your thing is off, you might want to turn your camera off at this point. So that would just be down at the stop video thing. So I'm going to go to gallery view. Um, okay. Hi. And just wanted to see, does anyone have any um, questions or want to share? Maybe you you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. Um, if anyone's done a one seed one community, um, okay, let's see, we got, what do I mean, raise your hand, you can all, I, I'm seeing you, but you can also raise your hand like electronically, you're, okay. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, make a co-host. Okay, there we go. Go on, Elizabeth, you have to unmute yourself too. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, really great to hear all the stuff. Um, you know, Beth, you're really inspiring some thoughts about um, one of the one of the things I'm seeing in the in the seed community is that cultural and ethnic groups are just going crazy. They're just moving so fast. And basically, white folks are like crawling along, you know, trying to figure it out. And um, I, I would, I think it'd be really interesting if we um, cross-cultured between places, you know, like if uh, I talked to a, um, a library manager the other day who said, hey, Elizabeth, when are we going to do a one seed one community again? I went, well, I'm not doing it this year. What do you want to do? And, and to put her in touch with other groups and, and I grow, grow a different culture that has more connective tissue like what you've been able to do in Cambridge with your uh, partner groups and, um, but grow connective tissue between people working in different places in the um, Northern hemisphere. <laughs> That's it. Awesome, thank you. Does anybody else want to, um... Anybody else want to, you can raise your hand by using the little icon down below and then I can. I will make one small comment in response. I will say um, that, you know, I we have these close partnerships with these certain groups, but um, this it's here I am making a presentation from across, you know, I'm from a different country in a different place. And, but really we were inspired, like I'm making a presentation about my experience that's based on being inspired by by you. And so it's <laughs> by Richmond Grows. And it's, um, but also that these community connections that you can make locally um, are wider than just any one initiative for sure. Like the, like what I've learned from each of the organizations we've worked with has inspired so much of different work beyond one seat one community too. We've got a food sustainability network and there's there's other committees that are doing great work um, in a variety of ways too. So definitely just saying I I I think your comments are very valid and and very um evident as well when you when in communities. Anybody who, anybody since our last, I don't know if anyone was here the last time that has taken any steps or has anyone done a one seed one community and wants to just kind of take a couple minutes to kind of share some initial thoughts. Okay, I'm looking for little, little hands coming up. Not seeing the, okay. Okay. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing anything. I'm seeing a couple people saying they're starting one, but not wanting to step up and, um, hold on, let me unmute you again there, Miss Elizabeth, hold on. Unmute. I think you can unmute yourself. If nobody's doing a One Seed, One Community project right now, I'd like to hear why not. Is there something well, actually? Oh, okay, yeah, well, this is just the second, this, the people that are taking the second class, so. Yeah, so, but yeah, it might be interesting to see if there's any barriers to people that are, mm -hmm. that have have tried to start and are struggling. Oh, there's a hand, okay, and now I gotta figure out how to do this. Um, hand, let's see, where's the hand? Hand, hand, hand. Oh, okay, great, there it's, okay. 
think I think you can unmute yourself. Okay, yes. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I was interested in getting a better picture of how did you determine the existing interest in launching the these types of programs in these different areas, like. You know, did we just say, hey, we just love seeds and we want to share the joy of seeds and then see if anybody else is interested or was there community need or uh, other motivating factor, uh, such as, you know, patrons coming in inquiring about such programs. So I, I would like to get a better picture of sort of gauging the market before I launch any type of program like this. I, I can speak a little to my experience, Rebecca, and then you can you can as well. Um, so, at the public library, we we do see various types of needs, and um, I'd say <laughs> doing program when we start our seed library. I think I said about the workshops was very important to us, and um, uh, seeing getting involved with this community partner of the food bank opened our eyes again. Public libraries see a lot of people in need and and a lot of people who are not necessarily in need, but interested in various things. Partnering with the food bank who also had a seed library and were supporting people who were using it in a different way. Like we have our seed library, we assumed was being used by uh, local gardeners. Um, but seeing that the food bank seed library was used by people who are in need of growing their own food, and that's an essential thing, uh, was made us realize that a portion of the people who are taking, uh, who are receiving our seeds are using it for that reason too. And, and we have that community in the public library as well of people who are in need. So it's a food security issue. And I think that opened our eyes and a part of our mandate for One Seed, One Community was to um, get seeds back for the food bank and food bank for uh, food back for the food bank as well. And so and I know that's that won't necessarily be everybody's goal, but um, we I guess part of I'm, what I'm saying is we saw we saw that there was a market for seeds and food and we thought One Seed, One Community could help um, fill that gap of seeds and food. So, so that's um, part of what we saw. And also at that point we had established our seed library and we had the statistics of how many people were, you know, people were coming to our workshops. People were, 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 were interested in community building, right? They were coming to one book, one community, one book, one community as library goers. They were taking seeds from the seed library. They were coming to our gardening workshops. So, and then that added piece of that realization of, of an, uh, another need in the community. We thought, hey, one seed, one community could uh, add something to all of this. So I think maybe that answers your question a little bit of having a sense of the market. Um, and if I miss something, please ask again. Yeah, and I think from our perspective, we were, obviously giving a lot of seeds away. So there was no shortage of the need for seeds. So by providing by providing seeds with a little bit extra of like, hey, you two can save your own seeds, you know, was hoping one that people could be a little bit more self-sufficient, but also, you know, realizing, oh, we're getting these seeds from some somewhere that they are actually being saved by someone. You can be part of that. So hoping that they're in really engaging with that idea of being part of I, I, people want to be part of a community. And so this is a great one to kind of self-select themselves into uh, people that, you know, they're already gardening, you know, and just doing this other thing and feeling like, oh, I'm giving something back to the community. I think a lot of people feel like they want to do something that's providing some value to others. And this is just a great way that they can be of service to themselves, but also to other people. And yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, our local challenge is the po post lockdown. The community is not attending in person live events like before. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's funny. I mean, we had an event, like I said, we had an event the other night and we had 45 people sign up and I'm like, well, this could be 10 people showing up. I was a little concerned. We had 40 people show up. I was just like, what? I mean, and, and 15 of those people had not even registered. So we're like, okay. You know, so, um, but I, I I can't speak to your area, but I but I sometimes you know having hybrid models or like having the class and you know recording it and so 
people that don't want to necessarily show up in person, you know, they still have the option to watch the recording of, you know, of, you know, the information. So thinking that that might be a way to go as well. Um, great. Okay. And then the native plants. So there's definitely, and this came up the last class, which is the idea of, you know, maybe people do a one C one community around a native, a native plant. So that's, that's something, I mean, I know in our community, food security is a really big issue, just like, um, Beth mentioned, you know, being an issue um, with some of the people in her community as well. Uh, we have five libraries right now that are specifically native seed libraries in the community. So uh, we were talking to them about, you know, maybe they just launched that they might do that as one of their, you know, future things being that they just literally opened up in the last two weeks. Um, great. Uh, Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go to the next piece of the class. So we still have a little bit more to, to do. Um, so let me go back to the next piece. So the next piece is like talking about picking the seed and let me see if I can go there. Okay. So this is from that, that uh, worksheet that you have. So once again, we in the first class talked about steps one through three, and now kind of deciding, you know, picking, you know, a bean, if you want to do something else, I know uh, the Michigan State Library, they, they've they been do doing a number of different seeds. So you don't have to do a bean. They've done lettuce. Um, as Beth mentioned, they've done tomatoes in their place. So um, you know, this is just, we just did it through the filter of the bean and we've done peas as well. Um, so wanting to think about, you know, when you, when you do it, determining how many packets you plan on distributing. So that might be a place to start. Some people are like, we're going to just start small and we're going to do like 30 and have it really concentrated and really like do it through a class and get to know these people and really build a much tighter community. So I've, I've heard some people that have done a one seat, one community where it's really much more, um, much more targeted in, in their approach. Uh, we've done kind of similar to, to Beth's group where we've just given lots of them out, you know, and hoping that, that, you know, in that people are touched and people are moved and people are saving seeds. You know, we don't know how many of them are actually doing it. Um, for the beans, we have been giving like 15 to 20, 20 to 25. Uh, we don't count. What I typically do is, um, you know, and I, and I'm a teacher, so I have lots of kids that need community service. So in the past we've done, you know, community seed packings, but lately just, you know, with all the kids that need community service, it's just really easy for me to give them a stack of papers. So I just have literally a stack, just like six labels and they're just on paper and we just staple them on. So, um, and you could staple it on the envelope and then staple it closed so that when they open the envelope, they don't lose the, lose the label. So that would be the better way. Um, I don't always do that, but because sometimes if they open them up, they might lose the, the label on it. And I just, I have the kids just count like, here's, you know, look what 15 or 20 looks like in your hand. And then just kind of like, you know, rough estimate that for the other ones. Um, just because when you're dealing with, you know, hundreds or thousands of packets, it it's a lot of time counting them out. So that's just kind of the route that we decided to go. Uh, and then kind of determining how many beans are you going to need. So some companies sell things by pounds, some sell them by, you know, number of seeds. So you have to kind of figure out what's going to work for you. I have on the um, seedlibraries.net on the One Seed One community, like spreadsheets that we've used, like we've gone all different directions. I don't know if I would do that again, but it's it was one of the ways we went originally. And if you... If you are get organized enough and you've done it a couple of years, one thing that you can think about also is for the following year, can we pick what we want to do the following year and maybe think now, can we can we contact a local grower so that next year we have something that's locally grown? Um, so that's kind of one of the things that we've done in the past where we've contacted someone and been like, we'd like you to grow this out for us. And so that will be our one seed one community next year. Or sometimes we'll do that in our grow a row program where we'll have someone who we know is a reliable grower for us, who's got a lot of land, like a, a horticulture department and being like, can you just grow a mess of like a whole bed of painted pony for us? And then, you know, we'll get like two big jars of painted pony back and then that will be our next, um, 
our next one C one community. So there's ways to do it where you can really, you know, eliminate most of the costs as well as start to have more locally grown seeds. Um, you know, which which for us has been a, a priority. Uh, how many beans to plant ideally to have a large enough yield? Um, so we're doing because we're doing a a bean that is a something can be eaten as a green bean. It's you know, the yield isn't as concerning. Whereas if it was a soup bean, you'd be a little bit disappointed where you let all this go to seed. And then at the end, you've got like two cups, you know? So um, you might want to be, people might be a little bit more miserly about sharing out that extra. So so I think when you have green beans, people feel like they can eat and then let them go to seed and you can still get a good enough yield. I think when you have like 15 to 20 plants, that's, that's a, a sizable crop and you could still feel like you could be, you know, giving some way to other people. Um, let's see. Um, yeah. So decide on where you want to be getting beans. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Where's the next. So this is some of the things that we've done in the past where we have, um, like had a spreadsheet. We were our first time out. We had done a couple of different like levels of, of beans per packet, where we had the, you know, we had care to share. So that was like 20. That was kind of more like, I'm going to plant some, I'm going to save some for myself. I'm going to give them to a neighbor. So that was kind of one level. And then we had the grow a row, which was like, I'm going to grow a row and return it. And then we had the bed of beans and those were our larger growers. So we kind of did those three different levels. Um, I think or we, we kind of went away from that. And just like, when I know I have a big grower, I'll just like, you know, get an envelope and just give them a whole bunch of extra, extra seeds. So we, we don't necessarily do that anymore. We were also looking at, you know, how many of, do we need in English and how many do we need in Spanish? Um, so for some of our, we're in a number of farmers markets tables. So the, the urban ag program that we're associated with, Urban Health, they do a farm stand. And so they're, they're going to have the one seed one community seeds out at their stands and they're servicing maybe 50% of the people are, are Spanish speakers. So we're just going to just have the, the Spanish and the English together and people can pick whichever packet um, works for them. When we tend to go to more like festivals or fairs and in the community, um, well, I think originally we had done, I think originally we had just done a whole bunch of English ones and then we had Spanish ones available. So if someone needed the Spanish label, we just we just gave it to them. Um, I think now we've got, we've got the Spanish and English separate, you know, and they're just color co coordinated. Um, and like, as, um, Beth said, you know, you can do the small coin op. It depends on like, when we do fava beans, we'll do something larger than that. And then also runner beans. When we do runner beans, we'll do the larger envelopes. And yeah, so getting, determining who's going to pack your seed. So, um, like I said, you could do a work party. You could have library volunteers. As I said, I just have lots of youth who do it that just, I give them and send them home and with lots of envelopes and they just come up and give stuff to us. Okay, do that kind of thing, yeah. Um, and then when we first did it, when we had it in a community, it was like just a, a production line. So we just had like, you know, someone packing, someone stapling, someone putting labels on. And so you can kind of decide, I mean, it depends on the volume when we were packaging, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them, you know, having more of a system made sense. If it's some a smaller project, then, you know, maybe someone taking their own stuff and doing it. I mean, obviously, I think you guys can figure that out. But that was just some suggestions we had come around. Um, yeah, and you can make your own envelopes. It's just a matter of like uh, how much volunteer time you have. And, you know, obviously, if you don't have the 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 money, there's ways to do this for less, less cost than others. Um, yeah. Great. So um, kind of... So at this point, we've got about 10 minutes left. We're just kind of needing like, what more support do people need? We do have this um, website, which I will put in the chat. Um, oopsie daisy, oopsie, it lost, sorry, it lost. I didn't, oopsie daisy, I forgot the one in the front of it. So we do have on, for people that don't know, there is a, um, there is a um, upbeat forum, which is 
which is a place where we have like a seed library forum, but we have a specific subgroup for the one seed one community. So if you feel like you have questions and you want, you know, to ask people of the group that are doing it themselves, that's a place where you can ask. I don't know like what people need or feel like would help them kind of be able to do this. So this is kind of the last bit of this of like, what do people need to kind of move forward? You've heard me, you've heard Beth. If you were here before, you also heard Elizabeth. Um, so it'd be nice to kind of hear what people are feeling like they need. Also, if I missed any questions in the process, you can kind of raise your hand or put stuff in the chat. Okay, one question, let's see. The last entry is supposed to be linked to click on. It's the, la the last entry, yes. And I think you have to enter it as like a, um, like an email. So if you've, you're an email and you put it in an email, then that would do it. I'm not 100% sure, but I'll send the directions in the email, follow-up email as well. But I just know like sometimes like, so I think I think to Elizabeth's point earlier, I was like, are, are people feeling like there's a hurdle to getting going? And if, the, if there are hurdles, like what, what can the community do to kind of help figure out how to support you? Because that's what we're trying, like I'm learning. I mean, I learned so much from Beth when we had the conversation like this past week. I was like, oh, that's so cool. That's so awesome. So we're all just learning from each other and, you know, knowing where do we get stuck and how can we get each other unstuck and what resources um, are there like we have like the five emails that Hilly Salal who wrote this so like people that sign up we can send them emails um, throughout the process you know so if you have ideas we'd love to hear them where can I find labels other libraries use successfully um, and for this like I'm saying we yeah we don't have that information so that's why I'm saying if someone has done a one seed one community like maybe that's something we can see some of your packets, Beth. I know, I think our Richmond Grow stuff is up there on, and I don't know, um, maybe Elizabeth, you can share some of your One Seed community things to, to me so people can see different labels. So that might just be nice. And if anyone has them, you can email those to um, seedlibraries at gmail.net and I will I'll send that information in there. Let's see, okay. Um, and I think finding the labels is also going to depend on um, what your seed you picked. So like Beth and I both pick provider, but you might pick a different thing and then go a different direction. And Michigan Seed Library also has done a lot. So Michigan Seed Library would be a good resource to look. I, I, if you give me a few minutes, I can throw in the chat um, uh, an example of labels. Um, I just got to uh, just find them and um, place them in there. And then as far as the sticker labels, I can also put a a link to the, I, I mean, I'm not affiliated with Staples. I think my organization just has um, good. So if you can find it cheaper for another organization, but I can just put in the link of the bulk ones that we purchase, if that's what you mean. So I can, I can share our design and also I can share the link of the Staples sticker labels that we purchase to print on. So I can do that if that's helpful. Just give me a few minutes. <laughs> and um, to Pat, um, the Spanish translation thing. So yeah, what I, what I often do is I will, um, take our English translation, put them into something like Deeple or, you know, Google translate is another one. Deeple is a little bit better. And then I will share it with someone who's a native Spanish speaker so that they're not having to like, think that they have to word for word translate, but they're like, here's the English, here's the Spanish. Can you look over it? And when it's, when it's a request like that, I get a lot more, I get a lot, I get them a lot get them back quicker than when I say, here's the English, can you translate it? <laughs> it's just when people have the English and Spanish right next to it and it's already kind of done, it's, it's you know, I get quick responses. Um, okay. Any other kind of hurdles that people or like next steps or things. Cause the, the thing is like, I feel like doing it in community is the way to do it. And so if anyone's done one or you do one and you're like, this worked for us, this didn't work for you. Like this is the type of stuff that we want to like learn from. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. 
I would say, you know, one of the things Beth was talking about, and and libraries were part of our group, um, but we were a separate community group uh, that put it together and libraries came into it. And um, I really like that part of it, but tracking people, like sharing stories through the season and having the first year, having Hilly do the, having one person do the educational piece once a month was very important. And, um, and then creating the community of response to what was happening in the garden. And I was encouraging people to send their failure stories, you know, who ate your plants, you know, uh, uh, what happened, what happened next. And so that was happening too. And that, that really created the end where when we met and put all our seeds together, um, everybody there like knew each other through their gardening, through the, through the process. And when you're, and when you're saying education that Hilly did, you're talking about the emails that she sent out, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so you all have the emails on that worksheet that you gave. They're all on the bottom. So yeah. you have, and those are for beans, but you could tweak them for whatever and everything. Sure. And it's, I didn't show the last slide, but the last slide says everything we have done is um, public domain, open, you know, open source. You don't need to credit credit us or anything. It's all, you know, for the benefit of um, your communities to be used in any way that you you see fit. Um, and so I'm going to put in the provider Bush Bean label um, for the East Bay of San Francisco, which is where I'm coming from. So that's the one that's our that's our that's our English version there for people that want to see it. Let's see. Yeah. And I think this is also nice just to like know where to get stuff, you know, less expensively, you know, super helps. And 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 when we after we mixed everything together, we provided the seeds for the next ongoing crops, which was terrific you know okay. and yeah go and, ahead. And, and instead of buying your seeds every year you you grow them as a group and um that's where we learned how important the end in harvesting from healthy plants healthy beans they have to look good the appearance has to be good you have to freeze them for a week or two and um, make sure that they're very clean and all of that and then we mix them together so we had a good result from that. Yeah, thank you for mentioning the freezing. I was, I was going to do that. Very important. Yeah, so beans beans can be can have um, bean weevils living in them. And if you mix all of your beans together and someone brought in the bean weevil, you can lose your entire crop of everything that the community saved. And and um, yes, we've we've heard of some seed communities who have had that experience. It was a learning experience for everybody. But just so you know, just so you know, freeze your beans before you send them back out. Um, but it's also a nice thing that if you can also rotate them, maybe you do provider bean bush one one year and then you do paint a pony another year, and then the following year you can do provider again from the stuff that you saved before. And we didn't go into it much today, but it's one of the things on the worksheet, and Beth talked about it as well as having some kind of end time where you kind of come together and you celebrate and and um and that could be the time where you process the seeds um so sometimes do it as a as a processing seed and bring your and you know bring your you know ones to share with everybody so um once again a huge huge thank you beth for for sharing your experience and really really great to hear another perspective elizabeth for coming in last time and again today kay for helping out in chat and once again next week if you were interested we will be doing a um, grow a row, which is how to get your community to grow a row specifically to seed for the community. So uh, myself and Kay will be doing the second in a series of classes um, next week on Sunday. And you can sign up for that at, um, I'll just put it in the chat, but it's um, at seedlibraries.net. I will be sending out the resources in the next couple of days. We'll send a video of this and then um, Beth can share out the packets that they have. And Elizabeth, do you have any packets too? And then I'll just put all this on the seed libraries, um, one seed, one community, so that it'll be there forever to be found. And if you have stuff, the whole point is that we do it in community, okay? And then you guys can share what, um, what awesome you're doing. You share. Yeah. And any last comments, um, Beth or Elizabeth, that you want to kind of share before we take off? 
I just put at the same time you were saying that I said, oh, just email me if you want the, but I'll, I'll email you some resources. You can send them out. If uh, people do have other questions though, if you do feel free to um, email me, I'll answer to the best of my ability um, uh, about my own experience, but um, um, I, I've been taking notes too about all kinds of experiences that I'll be, you know, hoping to grow our program too. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm just so eager to share and to learn. And um, it's really lovely to, to have been invited. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Okay. Thank you, people. Take care. Bye. 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 I forgot. I think when I stop recording, I stop.